He sold the best part of 25 million albums. He's had 23 hit records with his band. He's appeared in movies. He recently won an Ivor Novello Award for an outstanding collection of songs spread over many years. It's an absolute delight. You know who he is, and I'm delighted he's here. He is Gary Kemp. Thank you. By the end of the evening, you'll wonder why. <laughs> no, they won't do that. They'll be shouting, more, more, yeah. more. You're sounding good, man, and you're looking fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. So are you. No, no, no. Lovely place. It's a shame they don't do gothic TVs, really, is it? Oh, listen, they will. Give it time. We'll just put, stick a frame on this, and uh, we'll get some fairy <laughs> lights on it, and no one will not really know that it's uh, not 19th century neo-gothic. Um, I really enjoyed rereading your book. I read it when it came out, and I read it again over you know, the interim period. And I thought I'd better just do a catch up here. And it just sort of reminded me that you and I shared very similar childhoods in a way, and we shouldn't quite be here, you know, because we're both products of our own sense of reinvention in a way. Um, we've both consciously and deliberately reinvented our, ourselves, repackaged ourselves, and we're both from the same background. We, we both had net curtains on the windows. We, we, we both had dinner at midday and tea at six o'clock. Yeah, yeah. Um, lunch didn't exist. Lunch didn't exist, no. Lunch was for, for must be. My dad work. used to come home from work at one o'clock. He used to walk from the Angel right the way down to nearly um, Dorse, maybe at the end of Essex Road, the other end of Essex Road. And I'd come home from school and we'd have dinner then at one o'clock. Then he'd go back to work. And then in the evening it would be tea, which would be spam, mashed potatoes, that kind yeah. of thing. You know, cold, yeah. pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, we both had a distinct disadvantage in that our brothers were Adonises, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I tr sort of, I did, I, you know, I don't think we would have succeeded quite in the same way if it hadn't been for no, that fact. No, no, I certainly wouldn't. I mean, certainly, you know, growing up as a kid, you know, I, on my wall there were guitars and, and a dulcimer that my dad made for me. I remember taking it to school once and getting a stone thrown at it. <laughs> but, uh, and then on my brother's wall would be um, sort of Bruce Lee, Charlie George, and, uh, and by his bed a pair of his football boots that he'd painted sky blue and lined with fake fur. <laughs> I think you can put an exact day, let alone a, a year, to this image. But, I mean, can, can, Charlie George and Bruce Lee yeah. on the wall. But just to finish on that, you know, we had another bass player in our band when we were at school, um, a great bass player. And then Steve Dagger, who started managing us a few years old, maybe Richard here, I don't know, um, said, you know, you've got to get rid of your bass player. I said, well, why? You know, he plays really well. He said, well, he doesn't quite look like the rest of you, but... There's another reason. He said, well, who are we going to get? He said, well, you've got to get your brother. I said, but he can't play a note. He said, no, but he's the best looking bloke we know. And I looked down the bar and there's all these women just talk, talking to him. He was only 16. And I taught him as, as if that means like anything in music. <laughs> um, can we start? You're growing up in Islington. You were born late 50s, turn of the 60s, in 1959. Yep. What, what, what was the Kemp house like? Was it, was it just you and Martin? Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, it sounds really quite impoverished. Um, but we, 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 weren't, we, we rented a floor from a landlord, uh, which was basically a bedroom, uh, two bedrooms, uh, a living room, a tiny kitchen, and that's it. No front door. Uh, there were three families. There were my, my aunt and uncle at the top, my cousin at the bottom, and then in the basement, an old lady who actually died and got, was down there for about six weeks before anyone realised. My dad <laughs> thought there was something smelly that was infiltrating the house. But, um, and we all shared an outside toilet in the yard. So no bathroom. We would have a good wash in the sink yeah. once a week. Did you have a tin bath like we did? A tin bath, but it, it, it didn't really come out much. My dad used to take me to, uh, the, to, to the baths locally, yeah. which I... I hated. I mean, I was a snob even then, you know, because <laughs> I'd see the if the enamel had come off on the bar in the bath, I really didn't want to get in there. You know? Yeah, on the floor. 
all of that, you know, the guy smoking a roll up and pouring the hot water for <laughs> it's you. It's difficult to do that under a shower, though, isn't it? I mean, it just sounds like so long ago yeah. that it's a surprise that it, 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 it's. That was England, though, wasn't it? That was England post war. I mean, growing up. It's, it's and I was post austerity yeah, as well. Know. You know, we'd never had it so good. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, it surprised me recently growing up, uh, re reading back on the time I was going out. Rationing didn't actually stop till 55, you know, and it's like that could have been the Middle Ages for all that I was aware that rationing was in, in, in place. You know, it could have been the Black Death or, or the bubonic plague, you know, that rationing yeah. was in. in but, but there was something that, was, that had happened that made my generation very different to, say, the generation of rock stars that came before. And, and that is that, that the working classes were becoming famous and were mm. driving around in mm. flash cars. Mm. Um, I think the only way you could have done, achieved that maybe was as a boxer before, yeah, sport, before yeah. Tommy Steele. But, um, and I sort of, you know, I suppose there was, so for me, the, the possibilities, um, even though I was in that situation, yeah. were a lot greater yeah. than, than it, it may have been for someone a little bit older. Yes, yeah, I'm yeah. not looking at you, Richard. No, 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 of course you wouldn't. You're <laughs> most too much of a gentleman. Was there, was there music in the Kemp household? Was it, was it a musical house? Did you? Uh, no. Um, but there was music next door. And, and, uh, <laughs> Too loud by the sound of it. Yeah. Well, we lived next door to a pub. And, um, and it was really that cut glass, bottly, glittery kind of place that... And I remember I wasn't allowed in. Obviously, kids weren't allowed in in those days. And I could just see through the open doors when they'd swung open just how glamorous it looked in there. And it was an upright. And, 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 and I, my bedroom was... Um, next door to the pub and my bed was next, was right by that wall and at night I'd go to sleep and I'd I'd hear you know whatever it would be roll out the barrel or mm. some you know easy listening kind of singing yeah. um, so that was that was really clear in my head music um, I can see the influence of that on some of your later work <laughs> actually yeah. uh, and and then also on a Thursday that pub had mods arriving so I'd look out of my bedroom window and all the scooters would be lined up and my area was very much a mod area. Yeah. You know, kids cared about what they would wear. You know, my older cousins would spend all of their money on, on clothes and haircuts. And, yeah. and, um, and I'd watch them all gliding around on their scooters. And I remember that quite clearly and thinking how glorious it looked. Yeah, yeah. I think we all have people who come into our lives at the right time and it's the right person and they change our life in, uh, in, in absolutely dramatic ways, don't they? Um, and reading your book, I, you know, I see you going through a completely normal state school North London childhood. And then in 1968, a woman comes into your life who probably even now you look back and think, thank God she came into my life. And this is a woman called Anna Sher. Yeah. You, tell us a bit about her. <clears throat> She's incredible, um, Irish Jew. Um, arrives in England and just wants to teach drama, um, improvisational drama, mm. to, to young working class kids. Before then, to have any chance of getting into films or TV, you had to go to drama school. And to go to drama school, someone had to fund it. So, you know, if you were going to be working class and, uh, and, and an actor, your dad had to be a villain, probably, <laughs> to pay for it. Um, and she said it set this drama club up inside the, the council estate opposite to where I lived. Um, and found myself going. I mean, I'd been out walking the streets since I was five without my parents knowing where I was going yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, so I ended up going to this club, spending my pocket money, wasn't very much, going there. And um, suddenly got a, got a part in a, in, in, a t in, a, in a children's film foundation movie. Uh, called uh, Junket 1889. And it, my generation was Phil Daniels, Pauline Quirk, Linda Robson, Peter Hugo Daly, um, Ray Birdis. I mean, people have gone on and done a lot All since. through Anna Sher? Or All through Anna yeah, Sher. That yeah, was yeah. my generation. I mm. mean, obviously, after that came Kathy Burke and people like that. Um, but she, she had one uh, method, and that was just to instill confidence in people. Mm. So no matter how bad you were, she would look for the little kernel of... Mm good and really focus on it mm. and then you'd feel confident mm. so her whole thing was building confidence my my brother was terribly shy he'd walk past people in the street that he knew as a tiny 
as a small boy, and blush, and he couldn't mm. talk, and she really changed him. So you both went, you, and we both did you went. start together? Were you pushed into it, or did you say, I'd like to give that a go? No, my parents didn't even know I was going. My friend went, and he said, we should go there. It's good fun, you know. I don't know why. I mean, I just, mm. you know, maybe I was getting, you know, it just, it just seemed like a social thing to do. We just wandered in there, and just she, uh, because it was all improvisational, it was, um, it was almost like therapy, so she'd get kids to act out their problems. So you be the mum, uh, you're the kid, and you're late coming home, and your mum shouts at you, and then, but, you're, but you've been bullied, mm. and you need to somehow tell her about that. And so we'd act it out, and people mm. would, it was like therapy. Mm. Um, but we didn't know we were acting. Uh, and then suddenly directors would come down and start casting people. And eventually I got this part in a, in a, a lead in a children's film foundation movie, it, it, in 1971, the year I started uh, my senior school, I had to take six weeks off of school, which yeah. was great. What was and that called? It, it was called Hide and Seek. Hold it right there. <laughs> <laughs> because I just happen to have a clip of Hide and Seek right here, and it is an extraordinary piece. How old are you here then? Eleven. Well, you may have to move on. Is this not... I'm not at the beginning. No, this here, is a great opening scene, man. I love the opening scene. I, I think it's with someone else, though. <laughs> we'll see. That's, a, that's, a, that's, that's not me, though. Is it you? not? No, that's not me. <laughs> I've got the same haircut, but you'll have to wind on a bit. Well, we can do that. you'll find me. Oh, look, keep going. No, that's not me. I was going to say, don't get in that van anyway, because... What's up there? I don't think you've got any of me. What? I've got loads of you. No, I'm not in any of this. I'm not in any of this. I'm not in any of this. Is that not you, Gary? No, 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 no. I could just see... Oh, dear. Is that you, the butcher? No, that's Alfred Marx. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> well, you see, that's that kind of an evening, isn't is that, it? It's that you kind know? of evening. Okay. He's the boy who escapes from Borsal. I'm the good kid he meets. <laughs> And, and if you... Is that really not you? Oh, look, I, no, I can, I can just see you as that kid, though. No. I'm just going to hold that moment I've anyway. even forgotten his name. Um, but it was a big thing because uh, it was the 21st anniversary of the CFF, and it got a royal premiere at ABC um, Shaftesbury Avenue, and, and one in Deptford. And I was really a fish out of water in Deptford. I, said, I remember we had bottles being thrown at us while we were filming on the street, and I hated it. You know, yeah. I was quite a sensitive yeah. Yeah. kid, yeah, yeah, yeah. really. I wasn't rough. Um, but anyway, we met uh, the Duchess of Kent, and, uh, and I got filmed. I, I was interviewed by Film 71, who said, Do you, you know, would you like to be an actor when you grow up? And I said, no, I want to be a journalist. <laughs> the, um, and it was really because my dad, who was a printer in a factory, and had to leave school when he was 14 to... <laughs> feed the, you know, his own fam his mother's family, um, always had secret ambitions to have been a journalist and never yeah. really got the education. So I sort of said it for him, really. But um, I didn't really want to be an actor, because by then, I'd, I think I'd just found the guitar. Yeah. There's something in your book, there's a lovely passage in your book, which maybe... I wish that was me. What a I wish shame. It, I, no, I wish that was you, because, <laughs> I mean, that was uh, an almost disastrous um, introduction to my multimedia skills this evening. And, um, it set a very low benchmark from which I can only recover, and uh, <laughs> I, I can leave this place with my head held high. I feel that the Lord is watching over me, so... I'm, I, yeah, I'm quietly confident that today's, uh, this evening is going to end very On well. On highbrow, we'll cut to the bit that is me, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you, you wait till you see this being broadcast. The joys of live television is that by the time you watch that, I will be the slickest operator in town. <laughs> With one flick of the hand, one, one touch of a button. Gary, aged 11. At least it wasn't Simon Le Bon, anyway. No, no, that's true. <laughs> At least it wasn't Phil Collins. <laughs> okay, will you read for us um, about the, the first Christmas then, if you need glasses? I've got uh, yeah, well, um, no, I got, I got them brought over. Okay, okay. um, my parents bought me a guitar, which was a, which was a really mental thing to do. I have no idea why they did that. I wanted a toy. I was 11. It was for Christmas. And, um, you know, it came with this 
Burt Whedon playing a day book. I actually owned a guitar before I owned a record. So I never, we never listened to pop music. I didn't really know much about the Beatles. I kind of, I remember telling my parents that I thought the Rolling Stones were better than the Beatles once, but that was only to goad them, which it did. My dad was horrified, because uh, they were the devil. But, um, Would you let your daughter marry a Rolling Stone? Yeah. But I, um, he bought me this guitar and a Burt Whedon Plan a Day book. So like the first music I kind of knew was something like If I Had a Hammer. And, um, and I remember playing If I Had a Hammer and then thinking, well, I really like those chords, but I really hate this tune. But if it went like this, that would be much better. And this was, you know, after a month or so of having the guitar. So I wrote a sort of tune and then, uh, and then it was nearly Easter and my, my teacher said, well, what you're going to do is you're going to write an Easter song for this tune, because I played it to him. So I wrote these lyrics, and, um, and, and anyway, my dad then, I wrote this song, and I played it in front of the, I haven't played it in front of the school yet. My dad took me down to Waterloo Station, where there was an acetate booth, uh, to record it in. I so, remember that. For those of you under the age of 72, an acetate booth, not many of you here tonight, but... Uh, <laughs> For those few who are under 72, an acetate booth was like going into um, uh, one of these uh, photo me booths to get your photo taken, but it was the audio equivalent. You could go in there, put your quid in, or your 50p, or one and sixpence, whatever it was, and for maybe three minutes you could record something which would then slide out and it would be a vinyl record. It was to send a message to someone, it was an au au audio sort of um, postcard. Yeah. Uh, featured on uh, the, the original of um, Brighton Rock with uh, Richard Attenborough, you might remember, you film buffs. The weekend Dad drove me and my guitar to Waterloo, that weekend. In the novel Brighton Rock, the anti-hero Pinky records a nasty message for the innocent Rose in an acetate booth at a railway station. The booths were the size of telephone boxes and once inside you'd pop a coin in a slot and through a window you'd watch a smooth acetate disc being lowered onto a turntable. A needle landed, and as you spoke, your voice would be etched into the disc's soft blankness. When finished, the disc would slide out, equipped with an envelope for you to post it to a loved one, or as in Pinker's case, not so loved. In 1971, on the concourse at Waterloo Station, stood what must have been the last booth in London. The telephone now being ubiquitous, except, of course, in our house, <laughs> where we'd have to wait another four years for that modern pleasure. I slipped the plastic bag off my guitar and holding it ready to play, stepped into the booth. Dad, my guitar won't fit. <laughs> Go on, I've got to shut the door, you'll be all right. He, lift, he lifted the guitar gently and I bent sideways about 90 degrees. <clears throat> and the guitar's arm was now facing downwards. Dad carefully closed the door and I shuffled farther in. Hang on, he said, opening in again, I, I've got to put the money in. His arm reached through and the door banged against the front of my guitar as I pressed tighter against the opposite wall. OK, it's ready. Wait for the light. It lasts a minute. A minute? How long was my song? <laughs> he closed the airlock and it went silent. I saw the fresh black disc drop and the needle approach its edge. The red light went on and I looked outside at Dad, who was mouthing, go on, <laughs> through the glass. I began strumming. Jesus rode through Jericho on his way to the cross. <laughs> the station was busy with Easter trippers and I was aware of people glancing at us while I sang and Dad proudly guarded his young artist's recording studio. I reached the final verse and saw that the needle was only a few revolutions away from the end of the disc. He met Blind Bartimaeus, who his sight had lost. I sped up, trying to fit it all in. The final bars were now frantic as I began racing towards the end and then the light went off. The needle lifted and the disc whirred and started its sedate little journey towards the exit hole. I hadn't quite finished. Nevertheless, I'd made my first record. It felt warm and smelt of summer pavements. I clutched it all the way home in the car, staring at its grooves and wondering at the fine impression my song had made. I played it over and over on my parents' gramophone until its tiny trenches ploughed that Easter weekend on Waterloo Station wore into each other and my voice became a soft shadow receding into the distance until eventually I was gone. I must say, I've, I've enjoyed this book so much and 
not wishing to em embarrass my guest uh, yet. Um, you write beautifully, and, and the, the evocation of the time and the embarrassment that uh, you and I uh, grew up with, and it's 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 so crystal clear when you, when you read that or when you read it yourself off the page. It's um, it is, as they say, just like being there. Unfortunately. <laughs> um, Talking earlier, a little bit earlier about people who change your life, someone else came along, didn't he, uh, soon after your first uh, foray into recording. And it was a, a great band whose name I'd heard on the radio, being obviously older than you, but his was a name that I'd heard a lot in connection with the anti-apartheid movement. He was a, a, a bishop, a, 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 a reverend, so it would be appropriate to um, name check him here and for you to tell us what um, Trevor Huddleston did for you. Yeah, you know, he was, an, he was another sort of mentor, really. In fact, a great mentor in my music. Um, I precociously wrote two songs when I was 11 and played them at the school prize giving, when, at primary school. Um, the other one was called Alone, which my mum was horrified by because she didn't want people to think I was that miserable at 11. We all wrote that one, don't worry. And uh, my only friend's a sparrow, <coughs> I see him in the morning, I think was one line. And, um, um, and Trevor Huddleston was giving the prize, uh, prizes away. He was the Bishop of Stepney. I didn't know anything about him, of course. And he met me afterwards, and, um, and he must have got our address from the headmistress, because you know, no one could phone anyone and tell anyone what was going on then. People just came to the door. Mm. And one Thursday evening, and I know it was a Thursday because Top of the Pops was on, <laughs> um, the doorbell rang, and I looked out of the... The, the, the window and I saw these kids all sort of circling on their bikes because there was a bloke in purple robe standing on our door. So they're thinking someone's died inside. <laughs> it wasn't Prince. <laughs> it wasn't Prince. And the bishop came in and my mum was in a complete state, you know, plumping cushions, doing whatever she <laughs> could do, nervous wreck. Um, and he brought me a gift of a cassette recorder, and they'd only just come out. Before then, it was reel to reel. And he said, every time you write a song, I'd like you to record it and send it to me in Stepney. Um, and, and I made a connection because on the TV was Rod Stewart doing Maggie May. And that's when I thought, that's what I do. Mm. That's what I could do. And he also told me about how um, he, he was organising the first charity concert with The Who at the Oval. And how he'd just come back from Africa and given a young black kid a trumpet. Um, and so I did this for a bit. You know, I, I sent him, you know, we recorded it. And we said, I never saw him for, for many years. Um, but it, it inspired me, you know, yeah. to keep writing. And there was someone sort of listening out there that was much more important than, did, than anyone Did you send him the tapes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember we used to drive up to Stepney and we used to post them through his letterbox because mm. he never seemed to be in. Mm. So he was in Africa. Um, anyway, years later, he got in touch with me um, when the band was successful. And he's, he's, because I, I'd agreed to do an anti-apartheid concert at Clapham Common. Mm -hmm. And I was going to sing Through the Barricades, which I'd just written. And when I arrived there, he was thrilled, you know, and he said, he said, I don't know whether you remember, but... I bought a trumpet for a young black musician um, about the same time as I gave you a, a, a cassette recorder. And he's here today too. And it's Hugh Masekela. <laughs> so, so, yeah, good taste, the bishop, <clears throat> yeah? You know, it just planted little seeds. And yeah. I think, you know, it'd be great to do that to someone else, wouldn't it? Absolutely. You know, at some stage. Absolutely. No, 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 that's a wonderful... So, you know, my parents were here solid as a rock, always loving, always supporting, mm. Anna Schur, and the bishop. Yeah. And, uh, and so I felt a responsibility to yeah. do something, yeah. to make it work. So you're watching Top of the Pops and you see Rod Stewart. What else are you watching then? You're watching Bowie? <coughs> Is Bowie around? Yeah, I mean, I didn't buy um, records before T-Rex. Yeah. So Bowie and Bolan and Roxy Music. For me, pop music was theatrical. Yeah. It was about going to a world that it was much more exciting than the one I was living in. Mm. Um, and it was slightly about ambiguity sexually. Um, that was dangerous. 
You see, the Rolling Stones, long hair, that all gone. How do I outrage my parents? Mm. I like David Bowie. My dad thought that mm. was outrageous, mm. you know. Mm. I mean, he was, mm. he was disgusting, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but there was something so glamorous and glorious about it and untouchable and different. And, you know, the bit where he, a Ziggy, where he drapes his arm over Mick Ronson's shoulder and Starman and, you know, that bromance was yeah. so attractive. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and, and of course, Roxy. So, so glam rock and bands. But I went to a grammar school and it was really divided between the kids who liked Bowie and, and, and that kind of stuff. And then the middle class kids who liked Genesis. Frog. And, and yes. Frog, and frog rock. And with me, I'm always feeling wanting to be in two camps at once. I'm, I'm sort of wanting to be with the Bowie boys, yeah. but I also want, you know, at that time as a, going to a grammar school, I went to visit people's houses, actually the Landersman's house. Yeah. Um, Jay and Fran. And Fran, Jay and Fran. Who lived in Islington. The great cult, uh, um, These are counterculturalists. Two, two great sort of bohemian yeah. counterculture figures of the, of the 60s, 70s, 80s and, and 90s and beyond actually, weren't they? And I knew their son, Miles, and uh, Cosmo writes for the Times, obviously yeah. now. And I went there, it was that strangest house. It smelt weird. That was garlic. I never smelt that in my life. They had this weird oval pot hanging on the wall, which was a wok, which I'd never seen. Wine. I mean, I didn't know anyone <laughs> who drank wine. Uh, Is this the other side of the Essex Road from you? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and they, they ate pears for savoury food, you know, avocados. It's you know, just wrong, isn't it? It's just wrong. It was all very weird, but it was a kind of strange house, you know. There'd be old tennis rackets thrown on, on the staircase and cushions that were falling apart and, you know, posters peeling off the wall. And yet they had so much more money than, than we did, you know. Um, but it was something inspiring about it. Mm. Books, theatre. Mm. And I was kind of, I was always sort of looking culturally for something yeah. a bit more. Um, and so... I probably did buy a few Genesis records yeah. and uh, Yes records, yeah. trying to get in with that crowd. Yeah. yeah. You growing up then, so early, early mid 70s, you're sort of hitting your teens, you're 16, 14, 15, 16, and then you've got another beautiful moment coming on, along in music history, like, you know, you can wait for 20 years and then two come along together. You get, you get your glam rock and your, you know, your, your, your bowies and your roxes and so on. And then you get punk rock. Yeah. And you got those two within, what, three years? Like, well, like we all did. But, you know, for, for someone your age, that is quite a, a double whammy, isn't it, coming along? You I think? Mean, un unquestionably, you know, I think, you know, the 70s were the great time for youth culture. Um, and it was all coming out of England. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so we're having glam, and now we're, we're having punk. And in between all of that is soul. The, the soul boy and dancing to mm. black American 12-inch uh, records. But I was in a little band with some older guys. I'm never going to be able to sing later, you know. Yeah, 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 you'll be fine. Um, you know, doing kind of bit of country, bit of jazz funk, bit of Stevie Wonder, and a few of my own songs. And then Steve Dagger, who was older than me uh, at school, Steve went on to manage Spandau Ballet. He, he said, um, we've got to go and see this show that's on Saturday night uh, at the screen on the green. Mm. And we knew about it because one of the kids who was in Steve's year uh, was now assistant manager at the screen on the green. A guy called Steve Woolley who went on to be a very famous film producer and run Palace Pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we went to this, this gig which I'd kind of heard a buzz about the band and it was the Sex Pistols supported by a band called The Clash, their first ever concert, supported by the Buzzcocks. <laughs> Never heard of any of them again, did we? <laughs> and when I arrived, it was quite extraordinary because it, it was like a Bowie concert. There was all the Bromley contingent all buzzing around the front, wearing fancy clothes. And, and then when the band came on, I mean, I remember, I mean, for me, it was The Clash, you know, with their legs sprayed apart, covered in paint and boiler suits, noise happening. Yeah. And of course, then, then when Johnny came on and it was... And it was it just blew us all away, yeah. you know. And I felt terribly embarrassed. I think I was wearing bell bottoms or something. And, <laughs> and uh, but the next morning, I had a rehearsal with my band, and I went in and I said, "I'm leaving." Yeah. I said, and, "And 
I don't know what I'm going to do, but no I'm... No more Doobie Brothers, no, no more Doobie Brothers, no more long train coming or anything. <laughs> uh, and the next September, so a few weeks later, so at that gig was my brother and Steve, my brother, 14, and Steve Norman, who was going to be in my band, eventually our band. Yeah. And we went back to, we went to school in a few weeks later, down into the music room, and we were... We, we came across this other kid called John Keeble, yeah. uh, and who had a little drum kit, and we just started playing super, super fast yeah. uh, songs, like you know. Just so that, that that really was one of those sort of key moments where you just see something and think, "It's changed my life. I, I, that's what I want to do." Yeah. Yeah. And then at that point, we didn't have a singer, but and and the only reason Tony Hadley was called in was because he was taller than anyone we knew, and he was the only kid we knew with a leather jacket. Yeah, good enough. <laughs> I don't, that didn't need any explanation. That's, uh, that's what they call a no-brainer. He's in the band, man. And so he, he, he passed the audition. Yeah, and, and, yeah I uh, bet he did, yeah. And then, well, you, you, you know the bit about the other bass player. He, poor, uh, poor Richard. He, we, you know, my brother didn't end up in the band for another two years. Right. So what, what did you do over that two years, or two, two or three years before, well, we were you two. know, the next chapter that, that, that I'm coming yeah. to is obviously the band. But, you know, the, a three-year gestation period, you go through a lot of changes, don't you? You, 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 you improve because you're playing with people. As a songwriter, you get confidence and you know what you're good at and you, 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 you find where your skills yeah. are. You find your own voice, like not a singing voice, but a, a writer's voice as well. Were you doing all that stuff? Were you thinking, I'm going to be the, if you like, the Pete Towns end of the band. I'm going to be the one who writes the material and dictates where the, um, where, where the thing goes. I was goes. writing songs, but at that time, Steve Norman was also writing some songs, but we never wrote together. I've never, I'd never written with anybody. I, I really like writing on my own. Mm. Um, and, but I think we were getting our showmanship together, our craftsmanship, but we were too young. You know, we were too young for punk, too young for power pop. It wasn't our generation. Yeah. We were just missing it. Um, but I think being in a band is a very working class thing. It's working class kids want to be in gangs because they're strong that way. It's much more of an impact to all be wearing the same clothes, walking into a room with a bunch of guys mm. and, um, like a bundle of sticks, it's harder to break. Um, you know, I always think middle class kids, you know, they get their piano lessons, they feel more confident, they're well ed better educated, more likely to be a solo artist, you know, or, um, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. Or maybe not even go into music. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, we, we've, we felt strong in this group, um, but it wasn't our time. And then eventually my, my brother came in and we sort of, um, we were still looking to what to do and we were kind of playing power pop music but wearing soul boy clothes, it was all confused. Yeah. And we kind of went to ground for a while. But what we didn't realise was our turn was about to come, primarily because of a, a Welshman called Steve Strange and, a, and his mate called Rusty Egan. Yeah, yeah. Well, I heard about Steve Strange because he came into my dressing room when I was in the Doctors of Madness and said, I'm going to change my name to Strange because I enjoyed your gig so much. And I asked I, Richard the other day what his real name was, and he said it's strange. Well, sadly, yeah, and it gets better after you leave school, I can assure you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, he came, up, he came up to me in the dressing room after a Doctors of Madness gig in Newport or Glenfield, uh, you know, and uh, said, that was really bloody great, mate, you know, and uh, uh, I'm going to change my name to Strange. I thought, yes, 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 of course you are now. Just, Oh, I need to say he was the bane of my life for the next three years, and even to this day people said, am I anything to do with him? <laughs> Which I take rather badly, and I wish he'd never brought it up. Anyway, um, <laughs> we, 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 we find ourselves, but that's a lovely link, Gary, because we find ourselves in a London club culture, don't we? The fag end of um, uh, <clears throat> punk has gone, we've got a little bit of... Echo and the Bunny Men and, and, and Teardrop Explosives are all gone and, and then we've got people playing synthesizers with two fingers like, um, well, what were they called, orchestral manoeuvres in the dark and people like that. Not and quite yet, but It's yes. coming up, I can see it, craft work. Because it's actually it? only 1978. Um, we actually a 70s band in many ways. Mm. And we were looking at some photographs the other day uh, and they were all taken in the 70s. Mm. Um, Soho was, um, I'm sure you remember, was a really dark, bizarre place with sort of, you know, models upstairs and, and you know, this was a, a very poor time. Not yet, only him here. 
Um, and not, not full of alfresco dining, certainly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> unless you had no choice. <laughs> and, um, and Dagger again said, we've got to go here. And he showed me this flyer. And it was Bowie night. Yeah. Bowie validated, by the, by the end of the 70s, had validated dressing up like a woman, if you were a man, yeah. uh, um, um, soul music, yeah. um, Berlin, yeah. uh, electronic music. And, um, and so you go to, we, 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 he said, this is, this is, we've got to go here. This is run by uh, some, um, a lot of the kids were there for St. Martin's, and we knew some of the kids from St. Martin's uh, um, Fashion College. And, and I never forget seeing this strange guy with a quiff dressed as a Cossack on the yeah. door and uh, sort of waving his cigarette over people's heads like a wand, you know, saying it's two quid to get in. <laughs> and, and then going downstairs, and I was surprised that he was, he was my age, you know, so no one here was, was, a, was older than 21. Yeah. Um, and going down and hearing this throbbing electronic music, because Cr Rusty Egan, with love and hate tattooed on his art hands, had been to Berlin on this kind of... Berlin had become this mythical wonderland for everybody, you know, mostly because Bowie had recorded there, but because it was this little island of fun going on in a sea of misery, it seemed to us. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone sort of thought, it's like, you know, the Weimar Republic living again. Um, and, we, and he brought back a bit, a load of, of electronic music. Um, and that's what he was playing, along with Bowie and Iggy Pop, yeah. Anything that Bowie had ever blessed, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but it was really about the kids in there, because the kids were unbelievable. I'd never seen clothes like yeah. it. They'd made most of their own. There weren't shops selling it. You know, shaved heads, makeup, yes, fringes the, down yeah, here. Yeah, the, and, and, and the quiffs, I remember, like, literally a five-minute walk from here, where the centre point is, I remember seeing a quiff come round the corner a minute and a half before the person on it. And it, and it was Richard Jobson, you know, and it, it, in those days it was Jobbo. But the quiff did come round, like, almost the day before the rest of the person came. It was that extreme. Well, yeah. and, and you had clubs like Billy's, you had Well, it Legends. was Billy's. This is Billy's that yeah. I'm talking about, yeah. Billy's, Legends, and then, the, of course, you had the Blitz. And, and so... It's around this time that you formed a band that we, we all come to know and love. Yeah, uh, uh, basically, you know, Dagger had, had kind of informed me of the history of rock and roll. And it kind of went, you know, the first rock and roll, English rock and roll, that would have been Cliff Richard. Um, the you know, pop music in the 60s would have been the Beatles, Psychedelia would have been Pink Floyd, Glam would have been Bowie. Um, punk was the Sex Pistols, what is the next big thing? Well, maybe this is the next big thing, and if it is, then it should be you guys. Mm, right. mm. So it was an ambition before, it, before we even had the music, mm. because we knew we had to get rid of all the old power pop stuff. Mm. And we hadn't played for months, months, months. Um, and I, gradually the band members started going down there, and we, we chipped in and we bought a synthesizer. And, and I took it home, and, and I wrote what became the first album. Mm. And we thought, we want to be the house band here, but all these kids here hate to go and see bands. Because now, by now, they'd rejected bands. Yeah. They were the stars. Yeah. Well, that was a great idea. But we managed to make it work. And we, we made it work by not playing conventional places, but by pl playing at parties and events. Um, by playing at Steve Strange's birthday party at the Blitz, by playing at a Toya Wilcox bur uh, warehouse birthday party when she was just an actress mm. um, and by playing on the HMS Belfast yeah. uh, battleship and the Scala the all nighters at the and Scala and the Scala yeah. and one of those Scalas got filmed by Janet Street Porter for um, uh, LWT and in this black and white patina of sort of had already this patina of age about it because it was shot in black and white and um, and we never let record companies in we never gave record companies tapes you know, so we kept it all very mysterious. I mean, nowadays, someone would have filmed it on a phone and put it on YouTube, and someone would have written bollocks underneath, and it would have been all over in a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I know, they were totally different times. Um, 
So you're writing what I imagine becomes the first album at this point. You know, you're 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 doing. Uh... We wanted to be a cult group. We wanted to be different, you know. And we were doing this electronica, and it was to cut a long story short. Had you got the look at that point? Yeah, you know, it wasn't a look that we thought of for the band. It was this is how we were dressing at yeah. home, you know. Yeah. So we were getting kids making us clothes. My mum and dad, my mum would, my, sorry, my, my dad would, my mum would make us clothes. So we would like draw on bits of paper how we wanted the trousers and she would just pick, stick two bits of material together and that'll do, you know, a bit of material here for a cummerbund. And uh, yeah, that's sort of it really. Um, there were a few people selling clothes um, and I did buy a shirt off of a kid uh, and he'd, uh, it was a kind of a blousy number and he'd written his name in the in felt it pen in the on the back of the collar and Galliano. I don't have that shirt anymore. Darn! <laughs> but I remember having it. Um, and and but there was a difference between being a cult group. It, this was we wanted to sell records. Yeah. And during that documentary that we made, Dagger said to me, "There's one thing I want you to say in the interview. Don't care what else you say. I want you to say." we are going to sell millions of records. <laughs> I think I felt a bit shy and I said, we are going to sell <laughs> thousands of records. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Because we grew up buying singles. Yeah, you know, yeah. To us, the charts were like the Football League. Yeah. You wanted to get to number one. You yeah. wanted to be the best. Yeah. Um, but we also wanted to be culty. And eventually it would take us two years before we realised that you couldn't be a cult forever and if you wanted to be around and sell millions of records, you had to make something a little bit more commercial. Sure. But, I mean, it's a, it's a no-brainer and it's a, it's a cliché, but you are the quintessential 80s band in as much as the first album comes out in 1980 and you split in 1990. You define and you illustrate and you, you uh, entertain an entire decade and then you're gone. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Those first three or four years must have been amazing. From, from the time you're yeah. talking about now, Dagger gets you a record deal, you go in the studio, you record these songs, which one should we put out as a single? To cut a long story short, comes out as a single. It's power play on Radio One and everyone is playing it and everyone is anticipating it as well because your name is on everyone's lips, as they say. And it comes out, and it's a, it, it's a massive hit, isn't it? Your first single is a massive hit. It's not yeah. like we're building up to getting a hit yeah. record. You came, you, 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 you hit the market hard. But we were very, very conscious of trying to sell ourselves as being more than just making records. Um, we also had this posse of people. You know, they made films, they made clothes, they uh, took photographs, they spouted words, uh, they were journalists. And we tried to, to give it all at the same time. Uh, so we had our own label called Reformation and we had people designing sleeves for us mm. that never designed sleeves before. People like Robert Elms who came yeah, up with the name yeah, yeah. Spandau Ballet, you know, he, would, uh, he wrote our first review, he would write pieces for us. Um, what was the great line he said on, 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 on that, uh, the, the press release that Robert wrote? Yeah, I, I can't quote it verbatim, but... Uh, it was, oh, it's, well, it's, it's on Google, but Robert Elm's uh, press release, uh, Spandau Ballet, it's, you know, it's priceless, you know, and it's an object lesson in, in writing. We uh, weren't cynical in those days, you know, we mm. thought nothing of, you know, being rather arch. Yeah, yeah. I found that word because I looked up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lucky you didn't look here. <laughs> it would have been really Mike. But yeah. Um, and, um, and so when we went to New York in 81, you know, and I think I'd just written you know, a funkier number called Glow, maybe chart number one. Um, we went to New York, we took, 20, there were 21 of us. So we thought, well, we can't play a normal place. We, we played this, the underground club, uh, just below Warhol's offices uh, for Interview Magazine. And we, uh, we took all these fashion kids. We took our own DJ, Robert Elms, played. Um, and, and Rusty Egan was there, and, um, and then we did a big fashion show before, before we went on. And one of the models, actually one of the designers, I think, was Sade, who at that yeah, time didn't yeah. even know she could sing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, we always, we were very, very anti everything that had gone before, so we wouldn't talk to the enemy, we weren't interested in, you know, we wanted, you know, The Face was at, going to be our magazine, glossy, you know, yeah. we were going to be very anti-establishment yeah. rock, you know, establishment. And I think that's why they grew to hate us so yeah, much in yeah. the end, you know. 
Um, anyway, we sort of succeeded in New York because we, we, we made the front cover of Women's Wear Daily, which I, <laughs> sort of, kind of what we wanted, Don't really. It, and yeah. the Rolling Stones. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, that, that there was suddenly, Channel 4 started. And Channel 4 was going to be a sort of minorities channel. Mm. That's how it set itself up initially. But suddenly, all anyone was interested in were the kids from the Blitz and the kids from these other clubs that were all dotted around, you know, the Rum Runner in Birmingham, you know, whatever was going on in Sheffield with, with sure. Human League and ABC. Yeah. And suddenly, you, there must have been a meeting at, at Channel 4 that went, youth TV. Youth, yeah. And everybody in youth TV and anywhere in the media now wanted a kid with coloured hair to work mm. for them. Yeah. So, you know, if you had bleach blonde hair mm. you were, and a quiff, you were whisked into the offices. And, you know, th so the media was really opening up to this new mm. feeling. And the one thing that changed everything, that really made 80s English bands famous all over the world was MTV. Yeah. And Live Aid wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Someone said this to me the other day. Why do I think Live Aid happened? And I think it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for MTV, because yeah. MTV yeah. made everybody international stars. I was saying just as much to my students yesterday that you, there were some songs when I say the title of a song, you actually see a still from a video now. Yeah. You know, you say Bohemian Rhapsody, or you say Talking Heads. Um, uh, Watch in the day. Yeah, with the big yeah, suit. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Or, or sh um, um, See, I don't know the title of the song, but I know the clothes. Yeah, there you go. Sinead O'Connor, you know, no, nothing yeah, compares yeah, yeah. to you. You see the clip yeah. as well as hear the song. Yeah. Uh, so the um, symbiosis between the music and the moving image was so fortuitous, wasn't it? You know, for, for MTV and for bands of your generation especially, who rode the crest of the wave of that. Yeah. You got in right at the start of the pop video. Well, when we went to New York, in 81, I mean, it was like a fashion vacuum. I couldn't yeah. believe it. You know, yeah. It was like being an episode of The Brady Bunch. And then, and then MTV started and we went back and everyone was wearing the same as us. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and went to Italy. Everyone yeah. was wearing the same as us. You yeah. know, um, it, was, it, was, yeah. it was extraordinary. Sort of immediate homogenization of, of, of the globe as far yeah. as the youth were concerned. So, um, 1980, 81, 80, 82, chant number one. I don't need this pressure on or was my three-year-old child said and called it at the time, I won't eat in this restaurant. But um, 1983, uh, probably the, 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 the biggest hit uh, 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 from, from the canon of your work, which um, maybe you will pick up a guitar and just give us a little music to just uh, yeah. give us a breather. Uh, yeah. yeah, Richard wanted me to start with the encore first. Um, <laughs> um, it's, an old, it's an old way of doing it. I but mean, this it, song's so purple, I feel so embarrassed every time I play it now, really, because it, everyone seems to know it better than I do. And, uh, you know, I have a songwriter's voice. But just to give you some background, basically, uh, at the end of the second album, there was a feeling that, you know, we, you know, there were some of the kids that we were hanging out with at the time who were going, you know, we can't follow these guys anymore. They've been on top of the pop six times. It's not really cult, is it, you know? And, and I sort of realised that, I didn't have to keep chasing what's the latest rhythm that I need to write to, you know, what sound of my, all my friends going to be wanting to dance to in that club. And I could just actually breathe and write a song. Yeah. And it would not be written from the beat upwards, it would, or the riff, it would be written um, just Were you me writing playing. on a guitar generally or on a yeah, keyboard? Yeah, on a guitar. The yeah. first album was a lot on keyboard, and yeah. then generally on guitar. And... Um, and I had a bit of an unrequited sort of passion for someone at the time. Um, and, and I remember she gave me a book, Lolita. And, and I think I may have pulled a couple of lines out of there <laughs> for this song. But I was a bit embarrassed about writing this song because I didn't want her to find out it was about her. So I think I said, you know, why do I find it hard to write the next line when I want the truth to be said? Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. but really... I don't song... think I know this song. Okay, okay. <laughs> To be honest, the song I wanted to write was an Al Green song. So, of course, I'd been listening a lot to Marvin Gaye and Al Green. And I've spoken so much I won't be able to sing the high bits. I'm sure you will. I don't think the, the, the audience tonight will probably know this, so they probably won't be able to sing along with you or help you out at all, I wouldn't think.
So true, funny how it seems Always in time, but never in line for dreams Head over heels, when to toe This is the sound of my soul This is the sound Bought a ticket to the world Now I've come back again why do I find it hard to write the next line When I want the truth to be said I, 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 I know this much is true I, 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 I know this much is true With a thrill in my head and a pill on my tongue Tis all the nerves that have just begun Listening to Marvin all night long This is the sound of my soul This is the sound Always slipping from my hands Sands a time of its own Take your seaside arms and write the next line Cause I want the truth to be known I, 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 I know this much is true I, 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 I know this much is true Ticket to the world, but now I've come back again. Why do I find it hard to write the next line when I want the truth to be said? I, 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 I know this much is true. Is true. This much is true. This much is true. Oh, yeah. <laughs>I'm not going to let you take anything away from it. That is a piece of songwriting class. And it is beautiful. What was it like being a pop star in that madness, in the, mid, in the middle of that madness, the mid-80s, when you were, you were gods? You know, you were up there. You were, you were the, the, the gods of the day. What's it like? Um, well, it's pretty damn exciting, you yeah. know. And, uh, um, you know, we're kids. Yeah, of course. And um, it's, it's hard work. We... we um, you know, we were really conscientious. We were a good band live. Um, I like to think we still are, um, but that, that's to come, obviously. But um, it, um, and we would never go on stage drunk or out of it or in any way inebriated. So yeah. we, it, was, it was, and you know, the days were full of yeah. 
interviews and TVs and travelling and blah blah blah. And but it was it was it, you know it's everything you dream of you know. And the, the, you, you aim first of all to get a record contract. Then you aim to go on top of the pops. Then you think that's it now. And then oh I want to do the top of the pops in every country of the world. Yeah. You know. And then yeah. you you want to get to number one of course. Yeah. Number one in those days was really hard. Yeah. And when True got to number one, I mean that was absolutely incredible for us. You yeah. know, we 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 couldn't couldn't believe that. And then breaking in America. So you have all these kind of goals, but then. When you get there, you start to panic. And for me as a songwriter, I was constantly panicking because I just kept thinking, I've got to write another one. I've mm. got to keep it going. And, mm. you know, we'd all come off tour. And, um, you know, in fairness, you know, people would go on holiday and I was like, better write the next album. Yeah, you're as big as your last album, aren't you? Um, and, it's, and the expectation um, is getting bigger and bigger with every album. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and presumably you've got... Um, uh, a load of people that you're employing, and you, you've suddenly got these uh, responsibilities. Yeah. You've got you've got people working around you, and who are rather relying on you to keep keep the machine going. They are, and and we didn't make money very quickly because um, a lot of it was just going back into the machine, as it were, to keep it going. And and believe it or not, I wrote the first three albums at my mum and dad's house. Mm. Um, in my bedroom, and yeah. it, because I was living till I was 22, nearly 23, I was living at home. Um, you know, so Steve Strange would come around for a cup of tea with my mum, with his hair like that, you know, <laughs> and she'd go, you'll get terribly, sp terrible split ends like that, you know. <laughs> like that was the most of his worries, you know. <laughs> and uh, so and then Trevor Horn would come round, and I'd play, be playing in songs, and my mum and dad would have to go and wait in the kitchen while I was doing, doing yeah. that. And then eventually I was, could afford my own flat. And you were being photographed by Bailey and you were, you know, being flown off here and there to do your videos or to, to yeah. record. Yeah, because I think working class kids don't leave home until they get no, married. No, exactly. You know, and I wasn't getting married. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and eventually I got a paycheck and I can afford a flat. You, you know I'm very fond of you, Gary, and there's a, a, a little bit in your book around page 176, if you don't mind, which um, will give our, our, our friends here tonight, a sort of uh, insight into why I like you so much. It's this constant questioning and this sort of <coughs> interior battle you have about where you've come from and where you are. And you never take it for granted. You never, you, oh, anyway, enough about you. Let's talk about yeah, page right, 176. Right, right. Um, Richard asked me to read this. I've never read this out loud before. So um, anyway, I managed to find my glasses in, in a panic just before I got here. At the end of 1982, I bought a flat. I was the first person in my family's known history to ever own a property. Dad came over and helped me put up some shelves. Actually, he didn't help me. He, he put them up while I stood back saying, higher, no, lower. Um, I looked at him, his strong shoulder powering against the drill, a film of sweat forming on his forehead. I couldn't help but feel guilty. He was a man who'd worked hard all his life who'd virtually built the homes we'd lived in, who'd had a nervous breakdown in the process of trying to feed and clothe his beloved family, who'd done night shifts on Fleet Street to send us all on holidays, and then along I walked with a few tunes, um, a lot of playing in the non-musical sense of the word, and no DIY sense, and suddenly I'm owning my own place. Mum brought the tea in, and Dad wiped his brow. I'll run up some nice nets for your windows, she said, starting to put the hot cups down on a small cabinet. Not there, Mum! That's Tudor! <laughs> Flustered, she offered them to me. <coughs> you know, actually, Mum, you know, I, I thought I'd leave the windows, you know, with, with just shutters, you know, no curtains. Nets can look a bit, you know. You can't have them bare. Anyone can see in. I mean, people will think you're well, you know. <laughs> It was more than a physical move away from home. Those aspirational yearnings that I'd been nurturing since my visit to the Landersman's house all those years before were now fully fledged and allowed free flight. But as I placed art and books on the wall, church candles and interior magazines on the black enameled coffee table, I felt a strong sense of denying everything my family was. I sat on my William Morris chair, designed by the esteemed architect Philip Webb, I hasten to add, um, and with a glass of claret in my hand and something light and choral on the stereo, I realised I'd become middle class. But it's hard to justify the kind of money that a pop star can make 
while his mother and father still lived frugally in a council house. Sure, my brother and I would help them out, but here I get it wrong too. They didn't want or need that Wiener Werkstatt vase that I bought for their sideboard, nor, uh, I'm sure, the original William Morris tile I so patronizingly bestowed upon them and their mantelpiece. But my desire for higher things left me appearing like a snob. Or maybe I just was. Waves of pride and shame would alternately crash against me, especially when Martin and I parked our matching Porsches side by side outside our parents' home in a street full of rusting Fords. <laughs> were the locals proud of their prodigal sons, or were we rubbing salt, Malvern of course, into <laughs> the wounds of a beleaguered working class neighbourhood? Money left me a mass of neurotic contradictions, and as much as I wanted a more cultured lifestyle and aspired to the other side of the Essex Road, I was still riven with guilt about it and the fear that I might be deserting my roots. I mean, there's something wonderful about that, which is why I don't feel any um, shame about um, subjecting Gary to the, the indignity of reading that, because I think there's something wonderfully um, confessional about it, and open and, and unselfconscious and unpretentious, which uh, is a side that people who only know Spandau Ballet may, may not know about my good friend here. While we're being pretentious, can we talk about our love of um, arts and crafts and William Morris and the aesthetic movement and stuff? Where did that come from? Um. It, it, in, um, it started just, you know, I, I guess, wanting, wanting to look elsewhere for things. Um, I'm a romantic. Yeah. And a lot of my friends were into Corbusier at the time and Bauhaus. And, and I kind of got it as far as Macintosh. I like that. Yeah. But I just, for me, I like story in, in my furniture and my art. And I like romance and the human form. And, yeah, and, I, just, lines there. and I just, you know, I... The first paycheck, proper paycheck, I got from Spandau. I, I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, Steve Dagger giving everyone cash in Legends. <laughs> but, which I never had by the end of the evening. Um, um, I bought um, a William Morris chair, which I still have. Um, and, you know, I bought a sports car as well. Yeah. But the William Morris chair was the thing that I really wanted. I just, I suppose, you know, wanted something different. For you and Martin, you alluded to this in that last reading. You've got your, your, your Porsches. How, how were you accepted by your, your, your neighbours, your local community, the people that you would grew up with and who knew you as kids before you had the success? Were you local heroes who they embraced and, and it was like a slap on the back, good on you, or were you flash kids? No, no, no. I mean, I don't think my brother and I were brought up that way, you know, really. And, uh, and I think there was a lot of pride, uh, pride working both ways. You know, mm. I've always been very proud of my background and, my, and the people that I, you know, my family, and, uh, and, it, and it, was, it was working both ways. To be absolutely honest, we, we weren't around much <coughs> because by, by 1983 and true, you know, we were, we were just traveling nearly yeah. all the time. Um, um, you know, in America and Europe and uh, Australia, and uh, you know, we're, we're not, but the band were all very close to their parents. Mm. You know, mm. um, working class lads. Yeah. You know? well, Give us another song from that album. Yeah. Which is, heard a lot this Olympic year. Now there's a clue. Another great song, sold billions, been featured in uh, every TV program through the summer. Yeah, we were, we, I guess it became a sort of people's, people's anthem during the Olympics. Yeah. And people must be pretty bored with it by now because Absolute Radio decided to play it one, on their breakfast show after the Olympics as many times as we'd won gold. Uh, that must have broken Dagger's heart. <laughs> um, but this is a sort of different version. I did, the truth was, when I wrote it, I wanted to write a Bond theme, really, which is going on a few yards down the road, actually. Never too it? late. But, um, this is a sort of simplified version of it. Thank you for coming home Sorry that the chairs are all worn I left them here I could have sworn These are my salad days Slowly being eaten away Just 
another play for today Oh, but I'm proud of you, I'm proud of you There's nothing left to make me feel small Luck has left me standing so tall Yeah Gold I always believe in your soul You got the power to know You're indestructible I always believe it Cause you are gold I'm glad that you're bound to return Something I should have learned You're indestructible Always believe in After the rush is gone I hope you find a little more time Oh, I remember we were partners in crime only two years ago, a man with the suit and the face I knew that he was there on the case And now he's in love with you, he's in love with you My love is like a high prison wall And you could leave me standing so Always believe that you are gold I'm glad that you're bound to return Something I should have learned You're indestructible Always believe in your gold Ooh, you are gold I imagine it's no coincidence that the bossa nova version of gold comes out just in time for the next Olympics. Is that yeah. right, in Rio? Perfect, well, we man. Thought, why, 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 well, <laughs> why we wait? On the, uh, on, the, on the closing ceremony doing gold, followed by Duran doing Rio. I mean, it was a perfect match. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah there you go. It never happened. Oh, a beautiful link, man, because I wanted to talk about this. The, 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 the Live Aid years, if you like, the Band Aid Live Aid yeah. years when it was you and it was Duran Duran and it was George Michael and, you know, it was this huge sort of very public um, maybe uh, pseudo rivalries being played out in, um, in, in the public eye. Was, was there ever a, a rivalry between you and uh, Duran Duran, for example? Or? <laughs> <laughs> you By know, the tr I mean, this is bizarre, yeah. isn't it? But, you know, it was, we were fighting for the world. Mm. And at the end of the battle, they kind of got most of America and we got all of Europe. Mm. And, and we thought, let's kind of call it quits, we'll share Australia. Uh, but, can <laughs> we have, risk. but can we have the biggest song in America, please? You know, I mean, these are kids, yeah. Kid, yeah. you know, who are, are doing this. Yeah. And just working class, ordinary blokes yeah. who are, you know, having, you know, millions of kids deciding what they wear, what they listen to, what they do. I mean, it's an extraordinary amount of power. But none of us really got what to do with that power other than make ourselves some money, except Geldof. Mm -hmm. and, and I was, <laughs> typical of me, I was in an antique shop in King's Road, standing in the window looking at something, can, I, can, can you get that out of the window please? And when Geldof pressed his face up against the glass and saw me, and went, came in and said, did you see that extraordinary uh, news report on Ethiopia last night? You know, Michael Burke, and I hadn't. And he just said, you know, it's been going around in my mind. And I wondered, do you think that we could make a record? You know, us and get Duran, get Sting in, get, you know, Weller. Yeah. I thought, that's like no chance, you yeah. know. But I said, yes, you know. And, and, and um, I said, I'm going off to Japan. Let me know. Um, give me a call, you know. But I never thought it would happen because we, we all were so competitive, you know. Mm. Boy, George, who'd been the cloakroom attendant at Blitz, yeah. you know, just like hissy fit kind of 
Yeah. Beautiful boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had now got the, the most beautiful voice in the world sure. and was selling yeah. records everywhere. Um, anyway, I got the call in, um, in um, um, I can't remember what my pseudonym was at the hotel. It was, I think it was, it was usually, my old tour manager's here, he probably knows. Uh, it, it was, I think it was one of the characters from Brideshead who visited. <laughs> so, uh, you know, pompous wanker, I think, yeah. Geldof. <laughs> Geldof called me when he got on the, when I finally answered the phone. Not Lady Marchmont. No. <laughs> Charles. <laughs> and, um, <coughs> and it was on and we went, you know, but none of us knew how to do charity records because mm. no one had done one before. We didn't know how to do that humility, that humble, you know, I'm being altruistic and um, face. Yeah. Uh, so the night before, we, we were all getting pissed with Duran Duran in, at Tommy's Pop Show in Germany. Uh, and it was just unbelievable. I mean, our best player for this match of two, you know, teams was our drummer, as it always is. The drummer's the hardest drinker in, yeah, yeah. in, in, in any group. And, and he got stretched off within the first <laughs> 10 minutes before the twiglets had even arrived. Oh, it's not know? looking good for the boys from Islington, no. is it? But it did end up, I think, with my brother and John um, Taylor, the two most beautiful bass players in the world, apparently, just staring at each other at about sort of seven in the morning or whatever it was, with their, with their minders either side of them, you know. And I, one of them just gave in, and that was it. But we flew then to, on private planes to, um, to London, and we got in a Dame La Princess car, which we did at that time, you know. So we're going to do this record for starving people in Ethiopia, and we're pulling up in a Dame La Princess car, film crews all going, and my brother gets out, and I could see it, it's on YouTube now. He gets out, and he stands by the door, and he goes, we're back. <laughs> <laughs> um, Spin doctor, yeah. But the vibe in that room was incredible, you know. There was this weird Irish group. We thought, why are they here? They don't sell any records, you too. Mm. Right? <laughs> Uh, yeah. and, and then just a load of people, and I never, it was the, that was one of the greatest. You do tell a lovely uh, uh, anecdote about arriving at the studio, and you guys have all arrived in, in, in your various limos and stretch limos and rollers and damers, and mm. one of our more esteemed uh, participants in this rec recording arrived on foot. Well, it? yeah, because as soon as we got out of the car, you know, my brother's doing the we're back thing, I could see coming up the road in an old Mac and a scarf and a copy of The Observer under his arm, Sting. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him and I went, oh, bollocks. <laughs> you know, he, at least he had the sense to park his Dame La Princess around the corner. Yeah. Um, but, but I think Live Aid was the, and Band Aid, but Live Aid especially, was realising that the, the that power could be used. Um, and I, I'd like to put it into context, you know, the 60s, the counterculturalism of the 60s, was about sort of dropping out completely. Going out and just sort of, you know, making daisy chains and dancing a lot and complaining, mostly. It didn't really work <clears throat> at that time. It didn't do anything at that time. And of course, then, uh, you know, in the fields of Altamont, it all, that dream got destroyed. And we played around with glam rock for a bit, and then punk came. And punk was about being outside of the establishment, but kicking and screaming and trying to kick the doors in and burn it all down. What our generation did, I think probably from experience, uh, was, was try and change something properly from within side, mm. using our commercial power. And, and we did change a lot, you know. I mean, the general feeling towards, you know, from the government and Thatcher at that time was, was really not being very bothered about what was going on elsewhere outside of Great Britain you know, unless someone was invading one of our islands, but um, we gave people a vote that they never had. So every four years they would put a cross in the box and that was democracy. Suddenly there was a moment when you could change something with a postal order or a checkbook or, a, mm. you know, a, a piggy bank. And, and that sense of people power that, they, that, that was given to everybody, really by Geldof in 1985, never went away mm. and now people Think they have more. And I actually think you can trace back the kind of distrust in institutions. Um, you know, my dad would pull his forelock at everything. Um, you know, it, it kind of grew out of that, mm. really. Yeah, yeah. No, I buy that. I buy that. <laughs> will you do a song with me? Yeah, we'll do a song. We'll do, we'll do, do a song you? that um, we've done a couple of times together. 
This is one that I wrote for my missus, and she's here tonight, so that's lovely. Um, I love playing with Gary because he's always really self-effacing and said, I can't do much, I'll just chug along. And the next thing you know, he sort of changed his song around and um, he's selling 25 million coppers. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. It's a song called uh, A Sleek Dry Yell, which is uh, just an anagram. She's a barrel of laughs and a tangle of strange contradictions And she's a sleek dry yell and she knows me so well She could kiss and tell She's taken me on despite all my previous convictions And I guess she must know what she's doing But I wonder if she knows what she's doing to me Well, it feels like forever But I've never been one for predictions But with her soulful eyes And her long goodbyes She elects Fight. Her smile never misses, her kisses a sweet benediction. And I guess she must know what she's doing. I wonder if she knows what she's doing to me. Goddess from South Polynesia And it's easy to say But she blows me away Like a cosmic rain One touch would suffice I swear if you were ice She'd unfreeze you I guess she must know what she's doing But I wonder if she knows what she's doing to me Thank you. Thank God my wife's not here. I've never written a song about her. Oh, you're young. You've got time. <laughs> She'll be complaining already. Loads uh, of time. You've got your whole world ahead of you. Let's talk a bit about films. How do you like making movies? Yeah, I like, I like it. Um, I like very much doing the craze um, because, it, you know, these real characters um, that we could get our teeth around. I think it was, it was sort of... People thought it was very strange when they heard that two blokes from Spandau Ballet were cast in it, you know. <laughs> Um, you know, I was, I was very thin at that time, with longish hair, and, and I remember with my brother going round to Aunt May's house, um, and, and the Cray family, I have to say, were given money uh, for us to make the film, or for the film company to make the film, because they were worried about the insurance and them causing a fuss, so it was like, yeah, have some money. Um, and we went round to Aunt May's house at the top in Bethnal Green, you know, we took a big bouquet of flowers, She's got a, actually got a little uh, shrine to Ronnie and Reggie there with their sort of cigarette lighters. Sweet, really. <laughs> Blades. <laughs> you know. and, uh, and then we had to give her... They, the producer had to give her a pound because, uh, to, to use her name in the film. It's a, it's a law. And he goes, I'm going to give you this pound. And she went, oh, put it in me knickers. <laughs> and she was about 90. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't. But then as we were going to leave, my brother and I stood up and, uh, and Charlie Cray was there. He went, oh, God, for a minute, I thought it was my own two brothers standing there. I think, Charlie, you're getting your money. Right? <laughs> Don't have to push it. But, you know, every cab driver would tell us how to play it, you know. The, my favourite one was definitely the, 
the one, the taxi driver who sort of slid the glass back and went, you know how they got their superpowers, don't you? <laughs> what? <laughs> superpowers? You know? Their mum used to get them to drink the juice the Greens was boiled in. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Yeah, it's yeah, good. Yeah. I use that as a... Um, and, then, and then, but I think it seriously upset the band, obviously, you know, it wasn't... You know, Had you finished by then anyway? No, or, uh, it was... What was that, 19? Well, what really finished all of us was club culture. Mm. So, you know, when we started, we really promoted the idea of being in clubs and we made 12-inch mixes and we said, you're the star out on the, on the dance floor, you know. And we didn't even go on the road on the first album. And then... Um, Club culture grew and grew and grew, and like sort of Frankenstein's monster, it came back to eat us all. Mm. And suddenly, by the end of the 80s, kids didn't want bands. They, they wanted to take Ian Dance uh, to DJs. Yeah. And um, so it was, it was kind of, the timing was right anyway. But I think, you know, there was a sense of disloyalty within the band that Martin and I were doing the movie. And, um, and I'd kind of had enough of maybe writing and squeezing it all back into the box and I could sort of... You'd effectively been on the road for 10 years then, had you? Yeah, and I could sort of see what the future was, the near future was not going to mm. be good for us. Mm. And I just thought, I'll get more into this. And mm. uh, went to live in LA and did The Bodyguard and, and yeah. various films there. And, and, um, did you have any know, idea when... Never played <clears throat> with Spandau Ballet for the next 19 years. Yeah. When, when, when the band came to that end, did you have... A plan B? Did you think, I'm going to be an actor now, I'm going to, you know, that was that part of my life and now I'm going to move on or I'm going to write for other people, or I'm going to make no, solo albums? No, I was fed up with music. For... I never saw myself as a solo artist really and I wanted to make uh, films. Um, but making films is really a disappointment if you're a writer because they're only ever other people's yeah. words. Yeah. And then you do some really great work and it ends up on the cutting room floor. Mm, mm. Um, so you're not in charge, you know. Mm. And I, I was coming from a culture that was really in charge. We were talking was... to someone who went to see Ginger and Rosa last night. I am on the cutting room floor, man. Oh, are you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Well, not all of it, you know, but... Um, we'll, we'll have a whiskey. Three later. seconds remained, but they're um, priceless. So. But, uh, you know, I, my, um, my, my marriage broke down and I did then go to my guitar. Yeah. And I did do an album, which yeah. I'm very proud of, um, which is a sort of folk album. And, but it was a long time after that I really decided I wanted to get the band back together. And it was because I was doing this, this 5.1 remix of a live show yep. um, video and and I thought my god we could play you know why can't we why aren't we doing this now yeah. but by then you know three of the band had taken me to court for the publishing and it was a bit yeah. of a mess and uh, you know so how long did that messy sort of litigation animosity hang was that for, for well you know I never wanted to do another or... Spano album and that didn't help and then and then you know it's not it's not uncommon for people to start fighting over the only bit of the business that is still making money mm. which is mm. the songwriting mm. end um, and it was a weird day, the day I, the judgment was passed and I never lost, but Spandau Ballet were destroyed on the steps of, of the high courts and I went into Soho and here was a very different Soho to the Soho that we all, where we were running from skinheads in yeah, 1978, yeah, yeah. here yeah. was a Soho where it really was al fresco and you know, a, a street full of gay people, openly gay, you know, I mean, just an absolutely wonderful place mm. um, and not decrepit. And, and I sort of didn't really even raise a glass of champagne. I had a little bit to drink, thought I'd go home, and went home, turned on the TV, and there was someone blooded lying on the floor of a street. And I looked at it, and it was the street I'd just come from. Someone was trying to blow Soho back to 1978 yeah. with the bomb. The bomb that went off around the corner yeah. of the Admiral Duncan. And for right? me, there was a sort of, my God, you know, the band's gone, Soho's trying, you know, everything was rather down. Yeah. But of course, we came back with the biggest tour in that ever, so. Yeah, 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 <laughs> no, which is, which is absolutely brilliant, of course, and thank God for it. I mean, some of the projects that you've done subsequent to um, Spandau, Obviously, you haven't had necessarily the same amount of exposure, but they say I'm fascinated. You did something with uh, Guy Pratt, or a couple of things with Guy Pratt. Yeah, you know, I've, I've enjoyed writing musical theatre. We had something on at the National Theatre, uh, albeit briefly, but it worked. Yeah. I, I enjoy mixing theatre, and I like acting on stage. Yeah. And I think, in the end, I like performing, most yeah. of all. I like writing, but, uh, you know, being an actor on stage is, is much better than being filmed. You did the play art, didn't you, here yeah, in, in, did in art. the West End? Yeah, um, but I have to say, nothing has beaten 
Spandau, and when we got back together three years ago and we did our you know, world tour, and the tour of Britain was the biggest tour we'd ever done. Mm. Um, it was great. It was yeah. coming full circle. It was, make, you know, I'd been dreaming so much in those interim years of making it up with Tony or not making it up with Tony and feeling dreadful. And my life felt very unresolved because, you know, my life began with those boys. Yeah. So that tour was, was very magical for all of us. It was a real healing process. And in the same time, I think it was the best show we ever, we ever did. And, uh, you know, like to do some more. Do you think that... Um that conflict or that, that abrasion uh, between band members is an essential part of the creative process. I mean, you think of so many great bands. You think of The Who with Townsend and Daltrey always punching yeah. each other. Jagger and Richards always punching each other. Lennon and McCartney at each other's throats. Noel and Liam at each other's throats. You know. The Kinks. Yeah. The, the Kinks, famously. You know, is, it, is it part of the... the, the uh, the, the chemistry yeah. of a band, the dynamic I think, of a band I think, you depends know, on that having two strong individuals trying to outdo well, each other? in a way, I wish it had sort of been more like that in Spandau and there were more people writing. But, but I think that what makes a great band is that none of the individuals could be a great solo artist. Yeah. And that together you are something utterly unique and you're stronger than, mm. than the individuals concerned. Mm. Um, and, you know, I'd like to think that a great band is one where you can't change one single member, you know, of that group. Um, and, and I think at the moment, while people are all still alive, you know, that's the way it should be. Yeah. So what's the future? Uh, well, you know, we've, we're, we're, we're working on a film, um, a documentary, um, which I'm very excited about, um, and, and, a, and a book will be announced. Um, we are in negotiations for, okay. um, for a, you know, we want to get back on the road at some stage, yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I was lucky enough this afternoon to hear a snatch of a song that you're yeah. working uh, with... Um, uh, a very talented singer-songwriter called Tim Arnold, who's here tonight to sing a song with you. Yeah, Tim, and, and is this for, <clears throat> give us a, a, a bit of background. Tim, on Tim's this. this lovely, interesting man who, who, who wrote music f to suit Shakespeare at one point, and uh, he, he says it, he'll tell you better than me. He's he's a, a beautiful singer-songwriter who lives just down the road in Frith Street, and. As the Soho Hobo has written this wonderful album about Soho and about the characters who live here and about the, what it is to be part of this um, microcosm. But it is a microcosm, the album itself, because it can be any major city in the world, really. But it's, it's a beautiful album that mixes theatre and, and, and song. And I was really drawn to it. And then he asked me to um, sing a little bit with him on, on one of the tracks yep. um, which is beautifully produced and will be coming out soon um, but right now I'd like him to come up and strum an acoustic version of it so this is Tim Arnold ladies and gentlemen say hello Tim <laughs> hello Tim's been doing a great show by the way uh, this, a few nights at the Soho Arts Theatre um, uh, which is includes totally nude fan dance, which is not ugly, I have to say. Uh, but he doesn't do it. It's a, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's someone else who's doing it. Uh, because your mum was uh, a windmill girl, wasn't she? That's right, yes. My mother was the youngest ever nude at the windmill theatre. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? If she were here, she'd be standing up saying, yes, but I was in EastEnders for a year last year. And, um, Which is true as well. And, and Tim sings this beautiful song, beautiful melancholy song, while um, lovely Lydia is, uh, is doing her fan dance. It's while she's doing her fan dance. Well, she's not here, unfortunately. Will you do it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so After you, Neon Glow. Of the Lorelei, a 
rickshaw bell is ringing Do you know what those things cost? It's giving me a headache But without it, I'd be lost I'm turning a corner As I spot another chain This place don't stop changing But it's always been the same So kneel below Get smaller between a scoundrel and a gent. Where every day is the worst day of at least one person's life. Where every day is the best day of at least one person's life. We Uh, 
uh, this is the House of St Barnabas Charity for the Homeless. If you could put what you can afford in this hat, we're going to give that to the charity as well. Thank you very Thank much you. for coming. You've been fantastic. Thank you. Good work. Yeah, it's been so much good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.